Hello and welcome everyone to the Varsity Tutor Star Course Series, where today we are live from America's finest city and at the world's, not just America's most famous zoo, the San Diego Zoo. We've got Lisa in the studio here, Sarah out in the field, along with some amazing animals you're going to want to get to know as we learn all about habitats and the adaptations that help animals thrive there. Now, a couple of things before I turn it over to the folks at the zoo to get us started here. One, please keep this interactive. They're going to ask you some questions to find out what you know and want to know about these amazing animals and their adaptations. And we want to take your questions as well. So answer their questions in the chat box to the right of the screen. And if you've got any questions whatsoever, we're going to make sure that with every animal we meet, we get a chance to answer some of your questions and then all the way at the end of class too. So don't wait to be asked. If you've got questions, fire them away in the chat. Also make sure you've got a camera nearby because it's not a trip to the San Diego Zoo if you don't have the pictures to be able to prove it. So we're going to make sure you get some opportunities live on scene here to lean into the screen, snap a selfie, and we'll have some social media handles up on the way out if you want to tag your friends and tag those of us who may want to know about your trip. So with all that said, keep it interactive, have a camera near, nearby, and be ready to meet some amazing animals. But first, let's meet Lisa at the San Diego Zoo. Hi, thank you, Brian. Well, like Brian said, my name is Lisa, and I'm an educator here at the San Diego Zoo. Um, now, I promise I'm at the zoo, but I'm in one of our studios, and we're going to get a chance to meet my uh, some people who work with our wildlife um, in just a minute. But I first want to talk about today, we're going to be scientists. And so think to yourself, or maybe put into your chat, give me some things that you think a scientist does. What do they do? Hmm. Oh, and seeing a lot of really great answers, right? They study things. Um, they're asking questions. Um, a lot of, you know, they're just exploring, right? They want to know more. So thank you so much for those answers. And I think when we think about scientists, or at least I do, I sometimes think about scientists as wearing like a white lab coat and in the lab and doing experiments, right? And that is, that are, those are some scientists. But there are scientists that work around the world. And today we're going to be those scientists, right? We're gonna study animals. Um, we're gonna look at adaptations. So what helps these animals survive in their habitats, right? So if you're ready, if you've got your science hat on, I've got mine on, um, I, we're ready to go. So I'm gonna share my screen here. And first off, we're gonna start with, what is a habitat? So what do you think? Put some answers in the chat. What do you think is a habitat? Oh, I love that. A lot of you are saying that it's an animal's home. Um, it's a place where animals live. You're absolutely right. Give yourself a pat on your back if you were thinking along those lines. Well done. So you're absolutely right. And a habitat is a place where a plant, don't forget those plants, or an animal lives. It provides plants and animals with food, water, and a sense of safety. So, you know, you look at the pictures that we have here, you know, we have a giraffe eating the acacia. Um, so a giraffe is gonna be living in that savanna habitat. You have a spider that is drinking the dew drops off of their spider web. And what I would thought it was amazing is that that spider is actually creating their own habitat, right? It's a space for their, they're actually creating their own shelter. And it kind of makes you think. And then we also have the South African penguins um, creating a nest. Uh, so it's where the shelter of its nest, right? Part of its habitat. So with that, now that your, your science brains are kind of thinking, why don't you put in the chat box some types of habitats that you can think of? Oh, I'm seeing some really good ones. There's a tundra. You might be, I see some people listing deserts and rainforests. You're absolutely right. Those are all types of habitats that we have. So we're going to start with the tundra. Um, now, where do you think animals, or how do animals stay safe in their habitat if they're living in a tundra? Oh my gosh. 
You guys are so smart. I see a lot of answers with they're staying together. And in the case of a polar bear, they might even create dens. They create dens to keep themselves safe, right? Mommy polar bears are going to dig into that snow and create a safe space for their babies to be. Well done. So that's how they stay safe in their, uh, their tundra habitat. But there's all sorts of other habitats around the world. We have lakes and rivers, rainforests. Some of you mentioned that earlier. We have the savanna, mountains, tropical rainforests, and then down below in the desert. Now today, we're going to focus on two of these. You ready? We are going to focus on rainforests and on the deserts. All right, and I'm going to give you a little clue. There's actually, they're kind of opposites of each other. So I want you to think about what you, what would make them opposites of each other. See if we can figure it out by the end of the class. So we're going to start with rainforests. So in the chat, will you put in, what is one thing or a couple things that you know about a rainforest? I love all of these answers. You guys are so smart, such great scientists. So a lot of you are saying that there's a lot of rain. Absolutely right, it's in the name, right? It's a rainforest. Uh, there's lots of trees and many plants and animals. Um, it also can be really colorful, right? When you think about a rainforest, think about all those plants and the brightly colored maybe birds and different types of wildlife that live there. So, Rainforests are really unique because less than 6% of the Earth's surface are rainforests. So those little parts in the green, those are all rainforests. And you notice it's kind of in the center, right? Um, it's right around the equator, um, both a little bit north and a little bit south. There's not a lot of rainforests around the world. But even though there's not very many, or, you know, quantity-wise, there's 50% of the wildlife species live in those rainforests, making them really important. Um, call that biodiversity. There's a lot of different wildlife that lives in um, these, these rainforests. And the plants actually have their own adapt adaptations too, right? So they adapt to different amounts of sunlight. So if you think about you know, the, the top of the plants, they're gonna get the most sunlight, but as you go further and further down towards the ground, those plants that live on the ground are going to get very, very little sunlight. Um, so rainforests, uh, so that's a pretty unique adaptation um, for their different types of sunlight. Now, I've used that word adaptation a couple of different times. Does anybody know, you put it in the chat box, what an adaptation is? What do you think? Yeah, I see a lot of people saying that it's what helps an animal live in its habitat, right? So it's anything on the animal or behavior that helps them survive. Now, we like to say that there are three parts for the adaptation. Are you ready? Will you do them with me? Number one, body part. Number two, body covering. And number three, it's a behavior. I'm going to do that again if you'll say it with me. Number one is a body part. Number two is a body covering. And number three, it's a behavior. Um, and all of these that helps a plant or an animal survive in its habitat. So thinking about the rainforest, and now that we know what an adaptation is, can you put into the chat some ideas or adaptations uh, that would help an animal survive in a rainforest? Oh my goodness, scientists, you're doing such a great job. Absolutely, I see a lot of you saying things like camouflage. Yeah, camouflage is gonna be really important if you live it, it's a great adaptation if you live in the rainforest. Um, thick fur, think about it, if it's really, really rainy, you don't want to have like soft, thin fur, right? 
you'd be cold all the time and it, you're, uh, it would soak you. So you want thick fur to protect you from that rain. Um, potentially some hard shells to keep that rain off. Um, maybe long tails or hands that grab that would help you, you know, help these animals live um, in the trees. So um, a lot of these, and we call the animals that live in trees are boreal. Now, uh, or boreal just simply means they live in trees. Um, so with that, I think it is time for us to meet one of our uh, animal and wildlife animal ambassadors and my friend Sarah, who is actually out in the zoo. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Miss Lisa. All right, are you ready to show us? I'm ready. No, I am not the rainforest animal we're going to meet, but we are live here at the San Diego Zoo, and I want you to come follow me because we have an exclusive peek of one of our rainforest animals. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what that animal is yet. So I'm going to be just as surprised as you are. Um, right now, we are here in San Diego, and we are in a coastal desert. Uh, so I'm really kind of enjoying uh, where we're living. And I'm going to point out that there's a presentation in progress. And that means that we're going in here for that exclusive experience. So I'm going to take that off, and we're going to come on in. And what we're going to do is we are going to meet one of our wildlife care specialists right now and our animal. So you're going to kind of follow me this way. And we're going to get started. Okay, Sarah, my, hair, my head's a little bigger than yours. There we go. Did I push any buttons? Can you guys, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, Katie, yes. we can hear you. Awesome, awesome, okay. I always get nervous that I hit the mute button on accident or something. Okay, so my name is Katie. I'm a wildlife care specialist here in base camp. And I have with me my, my friend, Jamie, over here. But who you're probably a little bit more excited to meet is our other friend, Phuket. And he's slowly making his way out. And Phuket is a very interesting animal. He looks like a mix of so many different types of animals. Um, I kind of wouldn't mind, I know you guys have the chat that you can uh, you can write into, but if anybody wants to like throw out some guesses or text some things into that chat, what you think they are, and then Miss Lisa, if you could uh, let me know what everybody's thinking he is, if anybody knows what he might be, I'd love to hear what you guys think he is. It's one of my favorite games to play here at the zoo. <laughs> Okay, so we are seeing ants. I see a lot of people say, maybe a cat, um, oh. maybe a bear. I've got a oh. couple of otters in there too. Ah. Oh, I love it. Okay, okay. So I love there to me, there's no wrong answer because he honestly looks like something Dr. Seuss made. But I think more like Dr. Seuss got the inspiration <laughs> from this species of animal. He's technically called a binturong. And binturongs actually have a nickname. Their nickname is bear cat. So those of you that were guessing cat or bear, you're um, kind of, you're yes, pretty to bear or a cat. And this is where things get a little confusing. He, actually related to genets and civets, which then people are like, what in the world is a genet or a civet? Those are also really confusing animals to look at. When you look at that big family tree of animals, the genets, civets, binturongs are distantly related to the mongoose or a meerkat. The binturong just happens to be the largest member of that family group. And the food cat here weighs about 40 to 43 pounds or so. So he's called a Bornean binturong and he's a, kind of a big guy. He's about 13 years old. So he is, he's getting up there in age. So he's like slowly starting his day of training out here with us right now. We did wake him up from a little nap, but he'll start going right after he finds all the nice fig berries that have dropped out of the tree in this area and he reinforces himself. Now, binturongs can be found in Southeast Asian rainforests is where they're found and they're a nocturnal animal. 
So be nocturnal, that means he sleeps all day long and he wakes up at nighttime. Now, when he wakes up at night, he is much more active than what he is right now. Um, and he's going to go climbing all throughout the rainforest trees. And he's got some amazing adaptations to help him do that. Now, when we talk about adaptations, they're usually a body part that is very distinctive that we might notice about an animal. Does anybody want to type in any of the uh, ideas they see for an adaptation on this animal? Katie, I'm seeing some great answers. They're seeing his long tail, uh, his whiskers, oh. and even some claws oh. in his body shape. Yes, you guys, all of it, all of it is right. Okay, we're, I'm gonna, and Miss Lisa, you keep me on track if I get distracted, but I'm gonna try to cover all those adaptations. Okay, we'll talk about all of them. So his body and his tail are about the same length. So he has a very long tail and that tail is about a third of his body weight. So there's a lot of muscle in that tail and it is considered prehensile. So that means he can grasp with it. To have a prehensile body part, it just means it's grasping. So when you think about, you know, other animals with prehensile body parts, think about the elephant, you know, it's got a prehensile nose. The giraffe has a prehensile tongue. The binturong here has a prehensile tail. So he can grasp onto trees. And that is a great adaptation that helps him get around in the rainforest. Um, I'm very tall. All right, well, I think that we're gonna try to pick up our Ventron again, but are there any questions that you have so far about, oh, I love it, so some of the questions. Do rainforest animals ever leave the rainforest? That's such a thoughtful question. No, remember, we're talking about adaptations. So everything that we saw about Fu um, from his long tail, to his claws, to his long whiskers, and even that thick fur, it's as adapted to be in that rainforest. So he's not gonna do very well if he lives in a desert, right? Everything that he's kind of built around um, is for those living in those trees. Um, and then what about the rainforest makes them uniquely able to be home to so many different animals? That is a really, really good question. I think that it has to do with just the resources that are available. Um, and I know that I see Fu again, so I'm gonna hop off and we'll answer some more questions at the end of the presentation. Yes, thank you, thank you so much. I, um, do you want me to jump back on? I heard you were explaining some of those adaptations. Do you want me to jump back on with, the, with his tail and his usage of it there? Absolutely. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so with that tail, he's climbing throughout the rainforest and he's grasping onto branches with it, right? It's going to help him. So unlike, you know, our cats that climb up a tree, he can turn around, he can actually rotate those back ankles of his 180 degrees and then climb head first right back down the tree. And that is such an important adaptation to have in the rainforest, because not only is it gonna help him get to food sources, that was a good jump foo, um, it's gonna help him get to food sources and into different trees, but there is a very large orange and black striped animal that lives in that rainforest that he shares it with. And he, does, he wants to make sure that animal is not at the bottom of that tree before he goes down it. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? What's the orange and black striped animal from the rainforest? I know they know. They know, right? They do. They've got this a lot one. of tigers. Good job, okay. team. Okay, good, good. I just wanted to make sure they knew. Okay, so yeah, that tiger is definitely going to be hunting after this animal, even though he is a carnivore. Now, Whiskers, of course, being nocturnal, that's gonna help him feel his way around the trees and find things, the claws for climbing and digging into bark and things like that, and also marking his territory. But why this is a perfect opportunity to take a look at what he's eating. Now, I mentioned that he was a carnivore, but as you can see, Jamie here, she put a bunch of his food down on this rock and you're noticing there is not a single meat 
item. <laughs> so he is actually eating root vegetables, regular vegetables, fruit, and then a biscuit that kind of um, is what some of our herbivores would eat actually. His protein, he just doesn't find it very reinforcing. So he eats it later in the day. He has a sweet tooth. Do any of you out there like to eat dessert before you have dinner? Because I do. And so does Fu. He wants the sweet stuff and that's what he's going to work for for training. And then he'll get his protein later. So the reason why he's described as a carnivore is because he has what we call carnassial teeth. He has very sharp teeth in his mouth and his digestive tract is set up to be like a carnivore, but he does eat more in, of an omnivorous, so fruits, veggies, and meat diet, which what that translates into like us understanding is that what goes in comes out really fast. So this animal goes to the bathroom a lot. Isn't that right, Jamie? Yeah, <laughs> she's like, I have to clean it up every day. It's a lot. <laughs> so that's kind of what it, it equates to for us. He has a very fast metabolism and a very fast digestive tract is what that means. So, all right, now back to the bench wrong, um, some other cool things. Since I kind of got um, on the subject of, you know, gross stuff, there's something else I really want to talk about with bench wrongs, And I find it amazing. So you guys know that animals mark their territory, right? Bintrongs are a solitary animal. So they don't want any other bintrongs hanging around unless it's that special bintrong time of the year, which how do they know when it's that special time of the year? Well, they have to mark their territory. Does anybody know what animals use to mark their territories? Can somebody put it in the chat for me? What do you think they use? I've seen their tail. Uh, so mm -hmm. people are saying like special glands. Ooh, okay. Um, it's it's. Remember, we're on the subject of gross stuff at the zoo. Animals use urine to mark their territory. Some animals do use glands. They have glands to mark it. Um, but this one happens to use his territory or his urine to mark his territories. So what he will do is he will go to the bathroom, he'll rub his feet in it, he'll rub it into a tree, rub it into whatever, a rock, whatever it is that he wants to mark his territory with. Now, what's so amazing about the binturong is the way it smells. So most of the time, if you visit the zoo and somebody here asks you to smell something, it is a bad game to play. Don't play that game with anybody. Don't go smelling the stuff. Now, the binturong, when he goes to the bathroom, it actually, to us, it smells like hot buttered popcorn is what it smells like. And I love to share that little fact with people because if anybody ever goes on a, a traveling or out in the jungle and you smell hot buttered popcorn, I wanna make sure everybody looks up into the trees because you are not at a movie theater. You have found yourself a Bintrong's territory. So pretty cool, all the different things. And then the genets, they actually smell like Frito potato chips. It's kind of crazy, crazy the different smells you're gonna, gonna smell around the zoo. So, all right, I do wanna take a, a couple minutes so I can answer some questions. If anybody has any questions about Phuket, I do call him Phu for short. I know it's Phuket, but I can't call him Phu for short. So that's how I got his name, Phuket. So Katie, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, one that I was answering right before you came back on, but I'd love your thought on this, is what about rainforests make them uniquely able to be home to so many different animals? What are your What about the rainforest makes the yeah. rainforest? Oh, oh my gosh, oh. You know, there's such a diverse ecosystem. When you have something that is you know, it's warm, you've got a water, a consistent water supply, you've got a consistent food supply, you know, you've got protection, you've got trees, you've got all that and all that and all that incorporating into each other makes it to where these animals can thrive in these conditions. You know, could you imagine, you know, if you constantly had, I mean, we, we're pretty lucky, you know, we have grocery stores, we have places to go to get our food. But think about, I live in Southern California, technically our ecosystem is a desert, I can't grow a garden all year round here, it's not a great ecosystem to thrive in. But, but a rainforest, you know, there, it's always thriving and growing and new, there's always something new there. And so that kind of contributes to like all the diversity of that rainforest, which is, which is pretty amazing and makes it 
very much worthwhile of protecting. Thank you for that answer. Um, also, got a lot of questions around the tail. So can he use it for defense? Mm -hmm. Can he lift things with it? Can he mm -hmm. hang from it? Okay. And does he always have the same percentage um, of the, his body weight for tails? Man, like, these are really right? good questions. Okay, defense. No, he doesn't use it for defense, but I will say there have been a few times he's been climbing around on things and he whacks me with it and it doesn't feel great, but he didn't mean to use it as defense. I just got, I just got in the way and Jamie says he just did it to her a second ago. Um, lifting things with it, it's more like he can grasp things and then it goes with them. I've never seen him actually lift something like an elephant would use their trunk for. That's not what he's, he's more using it for balance and climbing and things like that. Now, I mentioned Fu is 13 years old. Um, when he was a younger scribe in Tarong, he could grasp, he could hang from that tail, like from the tip of his tail, and then turn around and climb all the way back up the tree to wherever he was going. Now at the age of 13, if he gets into a position where he's hanging from that tail, he needs to continue in the downward path. <laughs> he can't turn around and go back up. So, um, and that probably has more to do with, you know, his core strength too. Um, he used to do a lot of P90. I'm just kidding. He didn't do any P90, <laughs> but he was, he was very strong in the core, but he's getting old. Uh, 13 is actually getting up there for, for a bench wrong. So but don't tell him I said that. We uh, I don't want him to know. <laughs> okay, um, can Bintron swim? Did I get all those? Did I get all the questions? Can um, they swim? Oh. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So yes, they can swim. I don't think we can get the camera close enough because he doesn't like us touching his feet, but he actually has webbed toes so in between his little toes there's some webbing and it and it said because you know the rainforest floods so these guys oh look at that <laughs> he's like what are you doing lady um so there's webbing in between there so they are actually excellent little swimmers but uh jamie and i aren't so we haven't tried the whole swimming thing just in case foo's not a good swimmer <laughs> so we haven't tried that one with him so fair enough um and then we've got two more questions so oh there's this bear oh <laughs> this they're so scary he looked like a bear <laughs> um what do they eat and who what are their predators and okay I so what do they eat so so when i mentioned he's a carnivore like he's very opportunistic with the type with the food he's going to eat so he would hunt after things like <laughs> eggs in a nest or like something that is already deceased. He's gonna go and eat that because it's already been taken care of. Um, or he's going to go and hunt bananas growing in a tree. So that's kind of what his food sources would be in the rainforest. Um, here, he, he works for a big portion of his diet with training like we're doing right now. So, and he is one of the smartest animals I've ever worked with. He's a lot, a lot of fun to train. He gets, picks up on things really fast. So that's kind of fun that we can use like food reinforcement for that. And then what was the last part of, what was my last part of the question? Predators. Predators, yes. So in the rainforest, like there's going to be tigers, um, there's going to be large constrictors of different kinds, there, it, leopards, you know, there's so many different predators. If it eats meat, you know, he's, he's going to be on the menu. So that's why he's developed these adaptations to climb out onto branches to get to safer places. Um, he also being all black like that, he camouflages at night so easily um, and he can, he can hide hide really well from all those predators. Awesome. And then last question. Last question. Are okay. Bintrons dangerous? Because I don't know, he seems really comfortable with you and Jamie. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, I would have to say Phuket is probably the best binturong I've ever worked with. I've worked with a lot of different binturongs over my career um, here at the zoo and outside of this, of working at this establishment. And Fu is, he's got such a good demeanor. But what you're not seeing was the training that took place with young Fu. When Fu first came here to the zoo, we did three training sessions a day, every single day, rain or shine, holiday or not, we were here, he was here and we did training with him. And so I don't know if you can see the size of those claws or the size of those teeth in there, but 
he can be very dangerous. Ben Jurong's definitely can be dangerous, but I always, I always like to tell people, this is not a tame animal. This is, this is a trained animal. So Fu understands the concept of what we are asking him. He has every single wild instinct about him, but he knows how to get where his reinforcement, he knows what we're asking. He knows we're not gonna put him in a dangerous situation. And we've built a very strong relationship with him over the 13 years that he's been here. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so very much for showing us, Fu. That was amazing. So we'll I'm gonna give goodbye. you back to Sarah. To Fu, and then we'll come back and talk about our next habitat. Um, I do want to show you one thing. You know how Katie was talking about being able to come down the tree with 180 degrees? That's what our wrist can do. So if you can show me your wrist, right, and you can rotate your wrist all the way around. Okay. Now try doing that with your ankles. It doesn't work very well, does it? <laughs> so that's what he's able to do on his back and his ankles. He's able to actually rotate them so he can go ahead first straight down the tree. That is an amazing adaptation for surviving in a tree, especially if you're being chased by something like a tiger, right? So we talked about our rainforest animals. Now we're going to talk about our desert animals. Uh, oh, there we go. So a desert habitat. So in the chat, tell me what makes a desert habitat. What do you know about it? What uh, what they already what you already know about a desert? Ooh, okay. A lot of you are saying hot and dry, and you are absolutely correct. That is something that we think about with deserts, right? But to make it a desert, it is actually how much rain fall. It gets. So dry is the amount of water that evaporates is greater than the amount of rainfall. So basically makes just a little bit of rainfall um, it, that actually hits the ground. Um, so if you ever make like a small puddle on a hot day where you live, um, and you can measure every and then measure every hour, how does the uh, puddle grow? Does it shrink? Or does it stay the same? And that is actually how you can really easily see if it's evaporating, right? If um, it's it's disappearing. Um, so pretty amazing. And plants are adapted to store the weather to store the water in deserts. So even though we don't necessarily see the water. Um, there is water there out in those deserts. Think about cacti, um, those leaves being really thick. Um, if you live in places like, uh, like I do, I live in San Diego, we have a lot of succulents. Um, so they have thicker leaves that are able to kind of store a lot more water. Um, also, there's water that is underground. Um, so it is the, um, uh, so there might be some water there as well. Um, and many, and so how we did this with the tundra as well. Ooh, there's a clue. Think about the, the tundra. Does the tundra give get a lot of water? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Mm -hmm. oh, the tundra is actually a desert. I didn't know that until I started working at the zoo. Uh, so the tundra is actually a desert. Even though we see lots of snow, it doesn't really rain. So just like we did with the polar bears and how they survived in their den, put in the chat some ways you think animals survive in the desert. What are some of those adaptations that they have for survival? I see some really good answers. A lot of you are saying that they're nocturnal, right? So they've changed their behavior. Remember, an adaptation is a body part, a body covering, or a behavior that helps them to survive. So if you're nocturnal, that is going to help you survive because you're not going to be out in the middle of the day, right? Just like us, we try to stay inside when it's really, really hot. Um, maybe in the middle of the day and we'll go out in the mornings or in the evenings as it cools down. 
Same thing with our animals. We want to make sure that they're going to have those adaptations. I see some of you that you're they're covered in maybe scales. They have body, um, special body coverings that'll help uh, keep the water moisture in. Um, and then maybe they're in the dens and burrows. Nicely done. Oh, give yourselves a pat on your back. You're doing amazing. So, our, it's time to meet one of our desert animals. Um, and Ms. Sarah's going to show it to us, but I want to see if you can figure it out because you guys are scientists and I bet you can figure out what our next animal is. So I'm going to give you some clues. Most of the cousins of this animal live in the water, but this one lives on land. Hmm. It might have a special covering. Oh. Oh, I see it. So many of you said a turtle or a tortoise. You are absolutely right. Great job, scientists. And I see Miss Sarah ready with our desert tortoise. Yes, you are correct. We are meeting a desert tortoise. And he's actually been pretty fast today. His name is Mercury. And I'm going to give you a math problem right now. I'm going to kind of show you Mercury. Mercury was born in 1979, April of 1979. So maybe in the chat box, our scientists um, can put how old Mercury is. You didn't realize that you're going to be doing math here uh, at the San Diego Zoo. But some really fun information, always getting up really close, about Mercury, our desert tortoise, is that he can live a lot longer. Do we get the right answer in there? Do we get 43 from our scientists? Yes. And if we're talking our about, scientists... yeah, they got it. If we're yeah, talking about it. adaptations. Our desert tortoise, Mercury, has some really amazing adaptations. Right now is our cameraman, Will, is kind of filming the backside. But what is our desert tortoise covered with? So looking at his legs, his head, his face, what is he covered with? You want to put that in the chat box. So remember that adaptation of body part covering or behavior that helps some animals to survive. Oh, I see a lot of people writing scales. Good job, scientists. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of turn him around. He's very curious right now of this area. And we did see that hibiscus flower that they tried to feed to our bench wrong. And tortoises, they can see in color. Uh, that's why I can't have bright colored nail polish on because he might think my fingers are food. Let's see if he's going to go for it. Ah, there we go. Nothing like a little uh, snack in the afternoon. Now he is, I'm going to ask my scientists some more questions. What type of eater do you think he is? If he is only eating plants. Oh, I see a lot of people writing in herbivore. Great job, scientists. Yeah. Yeah, so he is an herbivore and those bright hibiscus flowers. Not only are they eating those, but they're eating grass, cactus. Here at the zoo, we are feeding them pellets and some mixed greens. And I like to say they're an opportunistic eater, is that if they're seeing those bright colors and flowers, our desert tortoises are going to eat them. So we're talking about adaptations. We talked about covering, so those scales and that shell. Um, I want everyone to feel their backbone right now. You guys all feel your backbone. So same thing with our tortoises, just right here. His backbone is connected so he can feel that. So a lot of times the cartoons, they have the tortoises or the turtles running out of their shell. They cannot do that. They are connected. And that shell is a body part that helps to protect him. So right now you see him kind of eating. I want you to uh, look closely or maybe in the chat box, my scientists do tortoises have teeth. Hmm. Look at it. He has a little bit of something on his lips, but I'm not going to get it for him. But do tortoises have teeth? And I'm going to tell you, give you a little think time. But they do not. They have something what we call a beak. So what they're using, and it's not like a bird beak, but that body part, his beak will help him to grab that food like he is doing right now. So that is another great adaptation. Uh, to help him to eat. You can kind of see he's still getting used to this space. So if we move too fast, what a behavior that he would do is he would kind of curl back up into his shell. Now, looking at Mercury, our desert tortoise, he's 
I'd say pretty fast for a tortoise, but he is really great for the ecosystem. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back to Poop. I know we talked about it with Foo, our Bincherong, but he is really great as serving a purpose for the desert. He is a seed disperser. Huh. What do you think that means? He is a seed disperser in the desert. I kind of gave you a clue. I think in the chat, your scientists are right. He is, let me kind of move him. He is eating those plants. And then when he goes to the bathroom, he's kind of like the gardener of the desert. He will poop out those seeds from the plants he eats and then they will start to grow. So I say well-being of tortoises, um, they really help us to determine the entire ecosystem, um, the desert ecosystem and how they are working. He's being very curious right now. And he is curious because I want you to think about maybe in the chat box, where do you think they live in the desert? Where do you think they would live? A lot of other desert species do take refuge um, in their spaces. So where do you think they live? A lot of our science friends are saying that they live in dens. Um, some answers like just out in the open and maybe they just tuck into their shells. Oh, great. So sometimes when they're looking for that food, they definitely are just going to tuck into that shell for protection. But they are also really great at making burrows. So if you look closely at his, those back feet, you will see that he has really long claws. And that is great for digging. I'm gonna turn him around one more time because um, he is definitely moving around. Now with all reptiles, we know that they are, what are they, cold-blooded or warm-blooded? Oh, these scientists know they are cold-blooded. I know they are cold-blooded. Yeah, they are cold-blooded. So they will spend a lot of their time basking in the sun. So we've talked about body parts, that shell, that vertebrae connected, the coverings, the scales. A great behavior is them digging and making those burrows for them awesome. to feel safe. And what I really like right now is uh, they are diurnal, but they are most active, and diurnal means that they um, are awake during the day, but they are most active a lot of times during dawn and dusk, and that's during the heat of the summer because it helps them to stay cooler. All right. Well, Sarah, we've got some really wonderful questions. So okay. first of all, what's under the shell? Oh, what is under the shell? Well, it is his body. And you know what? I'm going to pick him up for you. So I'm going to be very nice and careful. Um, so if you see underneath, so there, and then on the, so underneath that shell, it, she's like, she said, was the body. Um, so if you can imagine kind of your spine and your ribs, so feel your spine again, right in the back and then feel your ribs. Um, that's kind of what the underneath of the shell on the top part looks like. And then on the bottom, it's completely smooth. And then in the middle, it's all his body parts and his organs, which is pretty amazing. Um, some other questions that I'm seeing, which I love, is that, is this as big as they get? So this is one type of desert tortoise. And it's the California desert tortoise. And yeah, that's about as big as they get. Um, you might get like a little bit bigger as he grows, but he's done most of his growing because he's pretty old. And so that's about as big as he's going to get. Now, there are Galapagos tortoises that are huge. They weigh 500 pounds and they're absolutely massive. Um, so though that is the largest type of tortoise. Um, and then there are some tortoises that are even a little bit smaller. Um, so it, there's a whole range, but this is as big as the species is going to get. Yeah, Miss um, Lisa, he does not weigh 500 pounds because I'm not that strong. No. Uh, he's <laughs> right around, I'd say 20 to 25, but I wanted to show you that he does have that kind of back tail tucked in. And then underneath it is that hard shell too as well. So his whole body is connected to that shell and it grows with him. Perfect. And now we've got one last question, which I love. Um, uh, well, are they social? No, they like to live by themselves. But 
I love this one. I thought, think this is a great one to end on, which is why did turtles and tortoises evolve to be so slow? Oh, well, great question. And I want to tell you first before I answer that, that you, uh, those that are watching this live program, you're the only people in the entire world that get to see this right now. Um, so kind of a really special thing. But why are they so slow? And I will tell you there, some of them are slow, but uh, there is a pancake tortoise that is quite fast. Um, and that is for protection. But also these are cold blooded animals. So when they um, are moving so slow, they are not using as much energy. So it's a great way for them to conserve their energy for not moving too uh, fast. I'd say the only time that you would really see a uh, a tortoise either curl up in their shell or go um, really slow um, as if they are maybe looking for food and they're going slower, but really it's to conserve their energy. Awesome. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for showing us our desert tortoise. That was amazing. So everybody, I want you to wave goodbye to Mercury. Goodbye, Mercury. And I was going to say, Miss Lisa, if um, our scientists ask their parents about the name Mercury, the older grown-ups may know it kind of is a fun little pun on the play of words of uh, the Greek goddess history, uh, Mercury. So maybe something to look into. You know, we're always learning. Scientists are always learning. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. You're welcome. All right. Well, scientists, that is about the end of our time here. Um, thank you so much for coming. I hope that you more than anything, this has inspired you to learn more um, and to go be scientists out in your own community. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. If I can ask at least one more question to you, I promise it won't turn into a spell. It'll be one of the most popular questions we had earlier was Absolutely. how to spell binturong. So uh, we're just going to put that up on a slide. So oh, everybody. thank you so much. So, lots of <laughs> questions about that. People wanted to see that. And uh, yeah, nobody wants to have to try to spell it verbally from memory. So that's uh, that's binturong for you. Um, one last question while we've got you in the studio is uh, a lot of folks wanted to know, you know, being working with animals is a dream for so many of us. Um, the San Diego Zoo is sort of the pinnacle of being able to work with animals for so many people. Um, what can you tell us about what it's like working at the zoo? And then for kids who, you know, a lot of kids in, I think, Southern California today is, is back to school day. A lot of kids are going back to school over the last couple of weeks or maybe next week. Um, what things should we be thinking about in the school year to be able to get a job as cool as yours? Absolutely. Well, I think that I have the coolest job at the zoo because I get to work with a few little animals like Sarah, um, and then I get to teach about them. So I kind of considered myself a zoo uh, teacher. So I love that. Um, so, you know, being a teacher and an educator, um, kind of those, my background in, in teaching um, led me here, which I never thought I'd work at the zoo. But if you want to work with animals and wildlife, oh, the best way to do it is to volunteer. Um, once you get to a certain age, you can look at volunteering at um, local shelters and rehab facilities. Um, all of our wildlife care specialists, that's who we call keepers now, um, they have backgrounds in biology and conservation and ecology. So they all went to college. Um, and then a lot of the people who work here actually have master's degrees in things like conservation science. So if this is something that you're passionate about, I would say, yeah, absolutely. Start volunteering as soon as you can um, and then get an education that's going to help you support your goals and dreams. Awesome. A great message to have heading back into the school year. Um, I guess one more question. I sort of know the answers here. We're going to pop up some information on the screen here. Um, a lot of people wanted to know, is this it? Are there more classes? Um, you're back in September. Uh, we're going to do a, another class live, different animals from a pretty similar spot, more uh, more views, more animals from the zoo. So, uh, so you guys are back in September. We're excited for that. And in the meantime, on the way out, we're going to show everybody some information about how to watch the wildlife cams um, right there at San Diego. Zoo. So if you don't want to wait until September, you can check all of that out. And we're going to go back and forth between a couple of things. We also want you to be able to interact with Varsity Tutors here and with the San Diego Zoo on social media um, and learn a little bit about what we have to offer at Varsity Tutors. Learning members have all kinds of opportunities to learn about animals. Like Lisa mentioned, getting an education is a key to having these kind of dream jobs. So we'll, uh, we'll go back and forth with this information so you guys can connect with Varsity Tutors and with the San Diego Zoo. And uh, of course, we'll see everybody back here in September. So thanks, Lisa. Please thank Sarah and all 
to uh, the, um, oh, that, I was going to say zookeepers, but you told us that's not the name. But thanks to everybody at the zoo, and uh, we'll see all of you back here in September. Thank you so much.